Idori and Anthony, I see that your hand is raised. Do you have a comment or a question? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great, yes. I have an inquiry on, mm -hmm. the, uh, yes, on the, um, on the, sorry. <laughs> um, it would be on the import and export of food goods in the Bahamas. Okay. Uh, my interest is in the amount of foods that we um, import instead of produce ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. I've noticed that we um, import a lot of foods that we can grow here on the island. So I would like to, um, if that's addressed here, um, that would be of, of great interest to me. <laughs> Absolutely. That's a great comment. Um, as a development bank, we are concerned about our balance of trade, how much we are importing how, versus how much we are producing. I think that um, many of the panelists may touch upon that. So example, in Food of the Future, we'll hear about how we can diversify our species catches, how we can look at new kinds of food. I'm sure Vanessa has a lot to say about that, um, as well as ocean bioextractives, the things that can be produced from our ocean water, um, as well as um, how we can use our oceans as a source of energy and as battery storage. So we can, when we think about energy as an import, we have the possibility through our oceans to become a net exporter of energy. So those questions will be addressed and I hope you get the answers that you're looking for. Okay, thank you so much. Grateful to be a part of this. <laughs> thank you for coming. Okay, so it is 9.30 and we are now going to begin our first session, Food of the Future. Our moderator for this session is Regina Smith. She's a project officer in the Strategic Develop and Development and Initiatives Division within the Bahamas Development Bank. So I will now turn this session over to her. She will introduce the panelists and get us started. Good morning and thank you again, Sue. Um, just want to welcome everyone to our first session for the Blue Economy Think Tank. As Sue mentioned, I am Regina Smith, your host for this session. Our theme for this session is Food of the Future. And during this session, we're focusing on innovative solutions that can increase the value of fisheries and other food products while balancing sustainability. We want this session to be interactive. So please use the question and aid box at the top or bottom of your screen to ask questions throughout the session. We're also checking our social media pages for the audience questions as well. Now I'm pleased to introduce our panelists. Joining us today are Dr. Mara Hart, Director of Discovery at Future of Fish, Michael Boleg Jr., PhD candidate at the University of Exeter, John Chayton, Director of Quality Assurance at Tropic Seafood, and Vanessa Haley Benjamin, PhD candidate at the University of Auckland. Thank you all for being here. And we'll begin with our panelists sharing brief presentations about their respective topics, starting with Dr. Mara. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for, for this wonderful invitation. We're really excited to be here. And I wanna thank Regina and Samaya and Mr. Smith and the whole team at the Bahamas Development Bank for the opportunity to share with you all today. For the last few years, oh, before I do that, can you see my screen? Is that coming up? Yes, it is. In present mode? Yes. Okay, excellent. So for the last few years, Future of Fish has been working to understand how small scale fisheries can better benefit from as well as contribute to blue economies and sustainable blue economy development. And so this is a, a really exciting forum, the virtual uh, think tank that you put on today for us. And we're excited to be here to share some of our insights, but also learn from all of the great panelists who you have slated for the day. It's a really fantastic suite. I thought I would get started with just a brief introduction to Future of Fish for those of you not familiar. We are an international nonprofit organization and we work to drive innovation that can create social, economic and environmental benefits. And we do this focus mostly on small scale or what's known as artisanal fisheries around the world. And 
in order for coastal communities and industry and the oceans to be able to thrive, which for us is the definition of sustainable blue economy, we know that people and businesses need to do things a little bit differently uh, than they do today. And that kind of change um, can be difficult to, to always come by. Uh, behavior change is hard, changes in operations is difficult. And so when we go into a fishery system at Future Fish, we really try to look for first and foremost, where we can bring in some positive incentives, often in the form of social or economic incentives that can work to not only engage individuals and help them um, want to participate in, in some of the interventions and initiatives, but also these incentives can then create positive feedback loops where best practice is rewarded. And therefore those kinds of behaviors start to become the norm and are reinforced. And that helps lead to long-term engagement and long-term change, which is necessary when, when we're trying to transform a system. So incentives are really important. We also look to unlock resources, and we do this through strong partnerships and collaborations on the ground. Um, you know, we're not currently in the Bahamas. If we were, Bahamas Development Bank would be a fantastic partner because you all are um, looking to be, mission, you are mission aligned and looking to unlock some of your resources and have those flow into the system. Mm -hmm. And what we try to do is figure out how can we bridge and, and create stronger connections to the folks on the ground and the needs on the ground and those who have resources in the system. And so these resources can be financial but they can also be expertise and it can also be digital infrastructure or sometimes even physical infrastructure. We also then through all, throughout all of our project work, when we intervene, we make sure that we're embedding uh, data and metrics so that we can ensure that the benefits we're creating are flowing to those actors who are, are abiding by best practice. And we can monitor and look for how the system is responding in order to make um, adjustments and adapt as we move. Because these are very dynamic systems and often don't respond in the way we always anticipate. So that's how we approach our work. And I know that's a very high level introduction. So I thought that for today, I would share um, a tale of two Caletas. And in Chile, Caleta is a fishing cove. And so we've been working down in Chile for a few years now. And I thought that by sharing some more concrete examples of what our work looks like in practice, we'll be able to, to make this all a little bit more real. So the fishery that we work in, in, in Chile is the hake fishery. It's a white fish and it's the most popular domestically consumed fish in Chile. It's actually called the fish in, in um, Spanish, el pescado. And when we went in, you can see on the uh, left-hand side here, each boat represents a different caleta or fishing cove. And we found that for the fishers, they go out in the morning very early, they fish for a few hours and then they land their catch. And that catch is then sold as a whole fresh product through a very convoluted and messy supply chain to the end market. And most of this fish is consumed by folks who go down to a local farmer's market equivalent. They're called open air markets. And that's where they um, people purchase their fish. But to get to these open air markets, it often was seven, eight or more steps in the supply chain. And what we found was that the fishers and the open air market vendors who are, who are small enterprises were really getting squeezed and were having trouble making ends meet because so much of the value of this fishery was being caught up in this very inefficient middle. So we wanted to help kind of untangle this and, and figure out how we could redistribute and create more value so that fishers could continue to fish but and, and make a better living without having to catch more and that the market vendors could also support their small enterprises while still serving their community and supporting food security in their community. So what did we do? Well, the first thing is we met with individuals and held listening sessions and what we call co-design sessions. And this is a, a core tenant of our approach at Future of Fish, which is that we believe that the solutions lie within the stakeholders. And it was fantastic to hear from some of your speakers this morning um, from, from the minister about how um, engagement with all stakeholders is, is something that the Bahamas is prioritizing. Because these stakeholders, especially the fishing communities and fishers themselves have enormous insight into where things are stuck, as well as have ideas for how to move 
through some of those obstacles. They often just don't have the resources to support putting those ideas into action. So we did a lot of listening and we do a lot of design work. Here you can see folks were building out a prototype for a different type of distribution system using um, a whole bunch of different sort of creative arts and crafts. From these listening sessions, we started to hear um, both from the fishers and from the vendors that there were desires to have um, new, new supply lines created. So one of the first things that we did was we held a, a, a learning exchange between fishers and the market vendors. This was for some of the market vendors, the first time they'd actually been to some of these galettas where they actually were able to meet the fishers, see how the fish was caught, and also hear what some of the challenges were um, that the fishers faced, learn about the business of the fishers, and, and then vice versa. The fishers were able to learn about some of the, the limitations and constraints from the vendors, and they were able to start to talk about how they might start doing business together in a more effective way that benefited both ends of the supply chain. Other ideas that also surfaced from this work were how to create more diverse market channels. And some of this was also driven by the COVID-19 uh, crisis that came through um, in terms of how we could deliver product to consumers, again, as consumers were um, more limited in, in their ability to attend those uh, open air markets. So we actually launched in partnership with um, an NGO on the ground, Future of Fish has helped to launch a company called Me Coletta. This is a nonprofit organization which serves legal and responsible distribution services to the system. Uh, there's an online marketplace where consumers can buy product directly. There's also storefronts. And then as well as um, trucks also serve to deliver product through other outlets. So this was a new inter intervention into the system, which has helped to um, give more market channels and more resiliency to some of the Colettas. We've also supported the Colettas um, as they have formed um, cooperatives, which is a big, big step for them to be able to then apply for grants and loans. They were able to then start looking at product diversification and processing capacity. So some of the co-ops are now um, looking to create uh, vacuum sealed fillets rather than just the whole fresh product. And over on the right side, you see this um, bright blue double container stack. This is now offices and expanded processing capacity that we were able to help secure so that the, these Colettas again can start to expand their offerings. So in the end, what this looks like is that these, these fishing communities now have some more direct lines to market and more direct markets that they're able to go into. This builds resiliency and has resulted in several different benefits to the community, um, as well as providing the consumers, the citizens in Chile with greater access to fresh, legally caught, high quality product from their, their local fishers. So some of the specific benefits that have emerged through this new transformation are that um, through Mi Coletta, the organization guarantees a fair bottom price for fishers. And so they have um, the knowledge that they always will get a certain price. And then depending on market conditions, we're seeing for fresh fish that they can get up to 10 to 20% more than the past um, prices they were receiving at the beach. And for processed products, sometimes that percentage is even higher. Again, because we guarantee the Mi Coletta guarantees that price point, there's increased price stability, so fishers can plan better. We have data capture throughout this supply chain. It's um, on paper and through digital data systems so that we have better um, accounting and the co-ops can actually better track their quota um, by, by having um, better estimates of the volume of flow. And then of course, through our work again with, especially with formalization of, of the Colettas into fishing associations and cooperatives, and then supporting those cooperatives with capacity building in um, business planning, uh, supporting business model development. We've been able to secure additional capital um, up to 61,000 USD in San Antonio, over 100,000 USD in Dual. And this has come from both private and public funding sources um, to create sort of that blended finance approach to support development in, in these communities. So looking forward, we're um, really excited to see uh, expansion of this work. We're looking to, again, move more digital 
uh, data platforms into place. We're looking at an e-log book that fishers can be recording their catch. We're looking at um, expanding some of the digital um, tracking from the digital marketplace. And we're looking to um, expand the distribution and connection of Colettas now that we have the online marketplace, some storefronts, we're able to start to create demand for this product. And so then we're supporting um, more fishing communities to be able to formalize and uh, adopt those best practices so that they can start supplying into these new supply chains. Another area that we're looking at um, that we think is particularly important is we know that around the world, over half of seafood workers are women, but more often than not, they are overlooked and undervalued in their role in the supply chain and seafood supply chains. And in Chile, we see here, women are serving in a really important and critical processing role, but it's quite informal. And so some of the work we're looking to in the future is to work with partners who are experts in gender equity, again, financial access, to help formalize some of the, the um, working conditions for women to improve those working conditions, get stable salaries, and move them into a more formal role in, that, um, in the industry. Okay, so that's my story, our story from, from Chile. And it provides a couple of examples what I'd like to do now is to be able to sort of step a little bit wider. Um, we work across uh, multiple countries in Peru and Belize. We've worked in Southeast Asia. We've also conducted global studies. And from all of this combined work, we have been able to start to see some patterns and where we think there are really ripe areas of opportunity for folks to think about development when it comes to improving triple impact solutions for small scale fisheries as part of blue economy initiatives. And some of those areas of opportunity that we see coming up again and again, and we saw them in Chile, are things like increasing quality and product diversification. And, you know, in the Bahamas, you all have started to do this um, with your lobster fishery, which is MSC certified. So you've distinguished that product in the marketplace that's already a, a premium product due to um, the, the way that it um, has this certification. But product diversification can look like a lot of different things. So, um, you know, for, for some of the places where we work, where there is lobster, is if it's not just frozen tails, how can you think about whole live lobster? How can you think about canned or value add goods? Another area of opportunity is reducing waste and inefficiencies. So again, where processing is happening, how can fish byproducts from that processing actually be used to, to create things like feed for local aquaculture, where we have some great um, panelists coming up to talk about aquaculture opportunities. How can we start to actually create cross links between wild capture fisheries and the processing sector there and aquaculture feed or natural fertilizers? Um, as well as again, with the inefficiencies, looking at new supply chains and especially domestic market opportunities. Embedding technology uh, for data capture and trade is a huge area of opportunity. And then as, we, as I just mentioned, these cross links with other food production sectors. And I was really um, pleased to hear from the minister that the Bahamas has set up a sort of a working group to look cross sectorally, because I think there's tremendous opportunity there when we can connect uh, small scale fisheries and wild capture fisheries with some of the other food production sectors in particular. However, before we can realize these opportunities, we also must make sure that certain enabling conditions are in place. And time and again, we see that there are major gaps that are preventing innovation from being able to take root and flourish, especially when it comes to the ability for folks to bring investment and bring financial resources into small scale fishery systems. And so in order to help overcome this obstacle, we want to emphasize that formalization and association building, so creating cooperatives, strong fisher associations, is really key. Because before any capital can flow into the system, you have to have entities who can receive it, who are formal and legal structures. In that process, you can also be doing business capacity development, leadership development, and all these other things that then help to allow um, these organizations to grow their ideas and, and enact them in the real world. Of course, basic human services need to be met, human needs need to be met for any individual to be able to participate and think creatively about a change process. They have to be able to feel secure. Financial education and access is critical and gender equity. 
I want to point out here that sometimes these enabling conditions don't always have to be targeted at the fishers or at the fisher cooperatives or industry themselves, but that community based work is really important. And even at the household level, we see in, in many fisheries around the world that it's actually fisher wives and the women in the household who are in control of that household budget. They actually do more of the accounting. So bringing financial education and access to them can sometimes be the pathway to then helping fishers and helping fishing businesses to actually develop um, better capacity in that area. So we think with these enabling conditions in place, we can then build more robust fisher community and trade organizations. And those organizations can then be empowered to lead more socially responsible, environmentally sustainable and profitable business initiatives into the future. So to finalize, I know this has been a, a quick tour through, through our work and some of our ideas on how we can move small scale fisheries and wild capture fisheries forward into a sustainable blue economy space. And so the first steps that we would recommend for anyone who is thinking about how to integrate into this space, our pathway to innovation has three major steps. The first is to map the fishery system, to really understand the stuck points, where there are assets, for example, partners like a Bahamas Development Bank who are looking to, to move capital and support triple impact solutions and to look where value can be created in that supply chain. Then it's really critical to engage the community in listening and co-design sessions. Um, this is because not only do our fishers incredibly innovative, but they know where the stuck points are. And no matter how many resources a government has, it is impossible to 100% monitor and enforce wild capture fisheries, especially when they're scattered over enormous areas of the ocean. And so we need communities and we need fishing associations and we need industry to be on board with sustainable management and best practice. That way the government can focus on the areas of enforcement where it's really needed. And the, the industry itself, the co-ops can be part of that co-management process. And then finally, to connect the small scale fisheries with national and regional initiatives, such as the ones that the minister noted in his keynote, sustainable development goals, climate change commitments. We believe that coastal communities and small scale fishing communities are fantastic places to test and pioneer some of these solutions that not only can support thriving coastal communities, support sustainable fisheries management, but also help countries to meet their commitments to these national and regional initiatives. So I'm happy to take questions and um, look forward to discussing some of these ideas with all of you throughout the panel and the rest of the day. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Mara, for that wonderful presentation. Um, up next, we'll have Dr. Mr. John Chayton. John, are you ready? Yes, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Let me see here. Um, uh... Here we go. Okay. Okay. Uh, my, um, good morning. My name is John Chayton. I'm the director of quality assurance and aquaculture at Tropic Seafood here in Nassau. Uh, we are primarily a seafood processor. We process spiny lobster tails, conch, uh, Finfish, grouper, snapper, that sort of thing. We've been around for a long time, actually about 45, 50 years, um, previously known as Island Seafood. And then about 15 years ago, we built a new facility and started calling ourselves Tropic Seafood. It's all the same owners and basically the same business. Um, about uh, eight years ago or so, uh, we noticed that there was a slight diminishing trend in wild caught species landings. Uh, so, you know, we had to work harder to get the same quantity of product to come into our plant for processing. And we've seen this trend continue downward uh, over the years. So we realized uh, back then, and probably by about six years ago, that uh, well, there's a lot of factors that that, that 
causes. Uh, certainly, there's a natural periodicity in the populations of any species out there. But those are also coupled with environmental factors, such as hurricanes, which wipe out habitat, uh, like for the spiny lobster, and cultural factors, uh, everything from potential poaching issues to um, changes in socio uh, behaviors. Uh, we're going to get to that in a little bit. And the desire for the next generation to want to go out there and be fishermen. And then we're going to talk about a little bit how that's affecting landing and what we're doing about it. Well, what we decided to do was uh, we knew that in order to keep our infrastructure in place and keep our employees and their families uh, engaged in, in working and fed and everything else, we need to come up with another method to bring product into this plant. We could we knew that in the future we would not we could not be 100% dependent upon wild caught fisheries. So we started looking at aquaculture and trying to find the right candidate for aquaculture so we could grow our own fish so we could process it and sell it and keep this whole business going because it's been a lot of work and blood sweat and tears gone into this business over the years so we started uh, on a campaign to find the right species and we'll talk about that today as we go through the slideshow let's see here okay a uh, couple of real quick definitions here of uh, what uh, aquaculture, aquaponics, and hydroponics. And we're going to talk about uh, aquaculture and aquaponics today and a little bit about value added uh, products and what that means. Um, <clears throat> one thing to realize is that aquaponics is a type of hydroponics. The difference is that with aquaponics, the fish and plants are grown together in the same water system. It's a mutually beneficial system where the fish provide primary nutrients for the plants and the plants clean the water for the fish and the water goes round and round. Typically, uh, this is as organic of a system as you can get. Whereas with hydroponics, the plants are also grown without soil, just as in aquaponics, but they rely on uh, basically chemical nutrients and pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, things like that to keep um, the, the water quality uh, what it needs to be for the, for the plants. It's not necessarily as organic or let's say natural as an aquaponic system. It can be, but it's not always. Okay. Um, now, for a long time, people haven't really thought of that aquaculture and fish, aquaculture and aquaponics are really part of agriculture. So I made a quick list here of why they should be considered in the agriculture section of the Bahamas, and they are at this point in time. And you can read through this real quickly, uh, but they, it does provide potential export revenues, domestic sale revenues. Um, it leads to sustainability. In other words, aquaculture and aquaponics allow us to produce our own food instead of being entirely reliant upon uh, importation of food and, import, and in terms of producing revenues, uh, nothing's brought it more to light the importance of this especially with this past year with COVID here and how reliant upon the tourism industry the Bahamas has been for a long time. And what's right in our, staring us right in our faces is the fact that going forward, we cannot be 100% reliant upon tourism for our survival here. Okay. Now, traditionally, everybody's aware of how fantastic Nassau grouper is as a, as a species here in Bahamas. Uh, and as I mentioned, there's a lot of factors that are contributing to the diminishing trend in landings. And uh, certainly we have a, a closed grouper season, which is a great thing. So it allows the grouper to spawn during that season. It needs to be fully enforced so that uh, nobody's out there harvesting fish while they're in spawning aggregation. But uh, there are other issues with grouper. And here's an example. 
Uh, in the United States, uh, like in Florida specifically, grouper is now listed as a threatened species under the Endangered Species Act. This happened in 2016, five years ago. Um, hard to say what the biomass is and which way it's going here uh, for uh, Nassau grouper, but uh, we definitely have to stick to the rules and not harvest this fish during cold season, which is highly desirable. Okay, I made a list of why wild capture fisheries cannot be relied upon for future food supplies here. And again, I mentioned uh, dwindling populations and overfishing, IUU fishing, illegal, unregulated uh, fishing, poaching, global warming changes in sea temperature that cause extinction and species migration to cooler waters, coupled with increased severity of hurricanes, which wipe out natural habitat. These are real things that are happening here in Bahamas. The hurricanes that we had two years ago wiped out so much of the natural habitat for spiny lobster, they have not come back the way you, people probably think they're, you know, it's just a vast sea of spiny lobster out there. That is not the case. And I mentioned the cultural factors, such as number two, lack of next generation fishermen interested as uh, fishing as an occupation. And that's, the, that's decreased. Uh, we see sons that no longer want to continue in the family business, a tradition they've been working for their fathers on the lobster boats all these years. The fathers are ready to retire. They don't want to take over the boat and keep going. They want to sit at a desk, use a computer, and have a different way of life. Um, there's a lack of available and skilled personnel at sea. It's hard to find a good captain who's not already working. It's hard to find available crew that are willing to go to sea for extended periods of time, regardless of the good pay that is received for some of these jobs. Um, even business projections outlooks don't look so good. There's shorter season, restrictions on exports. Look what's happening with conch now. Um, I believe this is the last year, 2021, that we're going to be able to have conch exports. Traditionally, uh, our companies relied heavily on having a quota that we can export every year. And I believe in 2022, there are no more exports of conch in the Bahamas. Now, hopefully, there will always be conch for the locals and for tourists, and, and it can be consumed domestically. But that's not good for export business. It's not good for our business. Um, bureaucratic compliance. Okay, if you want to get into the seafood business, good luck. The bureaucratic bureaucratic compliance is I put current level. It's nightmarish. Really, it is the, all the paperwork involved and the traceability and the tracking. My full time job is really doing this for this company. Uh, and I've been doing this for a long time, so I'm fairly uh, efficient at it. And it, it, we, it's not just me doing it here. We have an entire team that does this. Now, the cost of going into business and the seafood business is very high, and especially due to compliance issues. Um, just for a quick example, there are probably 50 forms 50 records that we keep every single day in our processing uh, uh, processing area just to track what we're doing that have to be turned into fisheries, have to be turned into our markets, have to be turned into our customers, things like that. And there's a lack of experience and lack of training in food safety, HACCP, sanitation, fishing and handling, marketing and exportation. People don't really know how to do all these things, and so it's very really hard to, to get into this business. Now, there are courses offered, but again, one of the solutions we came up with is aquaculture. And the thing is to find the right species. That's, you know, for, and every environment is different. So if you have to find the right species for your environment, your geographic location, all the cultural factors that are involved. I mean, live here, this is an example of a, of a shrimp being farmed. 
Well, there have been shrimp farm uh, shrimp farms here in Bahamas in the past. I can think of a farm down in Long Island and also in Grand Bahama. Uh, but these products have to be produced uh, so that they're competitive on a global basis. And that's that's the key here. They need to be able to be produce uh, the same or better quality, but for a competitive price. Another possibility is aquaponics. And aquaponics has really a great, great potential here in Bahamas uh, as a, not only as a commercial entity, but also as a backyard farming entity where people can produce food for themselves at home it's a fun way to do it. It's a very practical way to do it. And um, also another uh, possibility is value added fisheries. And I put up a picture of a blue crab here because there are blue crab here in Bahamas. Uh, this is also an untapped resource here in Bahamas. Uh, there are several places where blue crabs are available in Andros and uh, in Nagua and different places. And this could be, uh, there's, very, uh, there's a lot of aspects to this. Like for example, there could be a meat extraction uh, processing plant. There could be a, uh, uh, what do they call that? Where you, you collect uh, soft shell, soft shell uh, shedding systems where these, these crabs are caught and kept in, in water trays. And when they're molted, when they molt, or this is how they grow, when they molt, they climb out of the shell and they have a new shell underneath, which is soft. And then the shell absorbs calcium ions from the water and it hardens over the next day or two. What happens is you take these crab and you pluck them out of the water before they get hard and you stack them in a box. Well, there's a gigantic global marketplace for this. This could be done here in the Bahamas. It's not being done by anyone. And these are very valuable products. I think a dozen uh, soft shell blue crab now usually sell for $80 a dozen. Okay, so there's a lot of potential opportunities here. I made a quick list here, another list of potential aquaculture candidates for aquaculture and uh, for culture in the Bahamas. There's some freshwater species, brackish water species, and saltwater species and even untapped marine resources like I mentioned blue crab, golden crab. We did an experimental golden crab fishery here uh, last few years and found that there was golden crab down. This is a very deep, deep water fishery. This is uh, fishing 1,500 to 2,000 feet deep. And there's also deep water prawns coming from that depth. Of course, there's things like uh, biomass uh, you have to do a study to determine what the biomass is and that's you know before you start harvesting a wild product and that goes for things like sea cucumber and anything you're taking out of the sea you have to understand what the what the natural biomass is and how fast it replicates but these are untapped resources here that could be utilized okay um the fact is and it's a sad fact but 99% of all aquaculture ventures fail for a couple of the same reasons. Okay, number one is they're production driven. In other words, they grow what they can grow, not what the market's calling for. You know, they say, well, gee, we could grow a tilapia, or we could grow this, or we could grow that. And the market may not be calling for that. So they grow the fish or the, or the shellfish, and then they try to market it and they say, gee, there's really not a big demand for it, or the price is lower than we thought and, and, and the business failed. An aquaculture venture, number one, has to be a market-driven initiative. You have to find the species that the market is calling for. And in every area of the world, the market is calling for a different product, not necessarily the same product all over the world. So you have to start with what the market wants, yeah, and then you look at the attributes of that product. In other words, does it have a decent price? Or, you, or because you don't want to produce something that doesn't have a good price, even if there's a strong market demand. Does it grow fast? What's the food conversion ratio? In other words, how much food, how many pounds of food do you have to give it to get one pound of fish out? Fish in, food in, fish out. 
Uh, and there are products out there that are like almost one-to-one -one, where you put a pound of food into the tank and you get a pound of fish out. That's as highly efficient as you can get. The Hi, John. Really yeah. quickly, um, we have, are we a bit compressed on time? So I know we have, we have a lot of great um, information, but can we uh, conclude in like two minutes so we can move on to the next panelist? Yes, I'm gonna whip through this. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, the second reason aquaculture ventures fail is because of poor planning. They don't do proper business planning and that is essential, okay? Um, I'm going to skip right over this slide. These are pros and cons of a potentially successful aquaculture business. But again, you need to pick something that is market driven. That's super. And now in Nassau, we've tried uh, growing the Nassau grouper. And although it grows very quickly, we found issues with the larvae culture. Survival of the larvae culture is extremely difficult. Um, we're taking it from broodstock through uh, the eggs and uh, into juvenile stages, growing it uh, works out fine, but uh, the larvae culture is very difficult. Um, we've tried all the flounder for the sashimi marketplace, uh, grow that really well, but we found the market demand wasn't really what it needed to be. We've done yellowtail kingfish uh, called himachi. We actually coined the term bahamachi because it was grown here. Great product, uh, very prone to parasites. Uh, so, um, it's spiny lobster larvae. Um, spiny lobster are very difficult to get through the larval stage. It's six months to a year. Nobody's ever done it on a commercial basis. It's very difficult to do. It uh, can be done through collection of uh, last stage larvae, which is called Corylus. Um and we do also ship live spine lobster to Asia. And that's uh, something I've been doing for a long, long time. And that's a very profitable and great thing for us here. It's also dependent on diplomatic relations uh, with China because they're, they're the primary marketplace. Um, now, this, uh, this is a value added product. You could grow conch. Conch grows very slowly. So you have to factor that in. And conch also produce pearls which are a value added product and it's possible to produce food. This is uh, showing some pictures of some um, other types of, of potential products. Um, um, ornamental fish, uh, mud crabs, again, blue crabs. These are blue crabs, soft shell back there. And there's different methods with aquaculture, net pen, floating pens, cage tanks, and things like this, raceways. A lot of ways to grow the fish. Currently here at Tropic Seafood, we're growing the American Red Snapper. It has been a phenomenal candidate for us. You can see my hand there in the upper left corner. That's just a typical fish. Uh, we have a very high food conversion ratio of, uh, well, efficient food conversion ratio of one to one. We send this out. We've been marketing studies to down thousands of pounds to the United States. Everybody loves this fish. Okay, with aquaponics, uh, again, uh, it's uh, utilizing fish and plants together in a growing system. You can have commercial systems, home systems. Uh, this is a guy who grows a million pounds of fish, a million pounds of food in one acre every year. A million pounds per acre. That's pretty crazy. Okay. These are some of the things you can grow with aquaponics, even value added sponges grow about everything. I've been doing aquaponics personally for about oh, almost 10 years and supplied probably 70% of my what fruit and vegetables and herbs we eat at home ourselves, grow ourselves about 70% of that for all that time. And it's fun. And there's self pride. When you produce your own food, it's a lot of self pride. Okay, so these are untapped resources. Uh, other things you can do, like I mentioned, ornamental food, uh, ornamental species, conch pearls. So many opportunities here in the Bahamas. Thank you. Thank you so much for this presentation, John. Um, it was a lot of information, but um, we're, we're definitely excited to have you on board as well. Um, so just a point of reference, if there are person, persons interested in aquaculture, um, the bank may be able to put on, put on a training session hosted by John. So if you are interested, please, you know, let us know and we can possibly arrange something.
So thank you again, John. And next up is Mr. Michael Bolleg. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. I'm just going to share my screen quickly. All right, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Yeah, okay, great. All right, great. Good morning, everyone. My name is Michael Bolek. Um, I want to thank the team at the Bahamas Development Bank for putting together this amazing event. Um, I'm currently a PhD student at the University of Exeter focused on Caribbean Spine Lobster Aquaculture Development in the Bahamas. I would also like to thank my funding bodies, the Life of Key Foundation through the Albeck Scholarship and the University of Exeter for providing me with the financial resources to undertake this research and do my PhD. And as well, thank you for the partner that's gonna be in my project, the Cape Lucia Institute of CEI out of Luther. So what I'm gonna do over the course of the presentation is quickly um, talk about the overall theme of bridging the gap, the road to Caribbean spiny lobster conservation aquaculture in the Bahamas. I'll give a quick general overview of aquaculture and the growth of it over the past um, two decades, speak briefly about spiny lobster aquaculture and what's being done globally, then kind of bring it back to the a Bahamian context and what can be done here um, locally, and then touch a bit on the aspects of my research that I deem um, important due to the time constraints. So firstly, what is aquaculture? Aquaculture pretty much is the rearing of aquatic species of plants for food, and currently is the fastest um, food production sector globally. As the FAO has estimated that by the 2030, about 62% of food fish will come from aquaculture. And this expansion, if you see, look on the graph that I have on the screen, starting in 1990, you can see that linear expansion of aquaculture has taken off significantly up until 2008, and it's still currently growing um, relatively well. And this aquaculture of all species, um, fin fish, crustacea, algae, and mollusks, and in different production regimes from inland aquaculture to marine and coastal aquaculture um, as well. Um, and pretty much aquaculture moving forward is gonna play a really crucial role in sustaining and maintaining and achieving the UN's United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And you see that I have some of them listed here on the slide. So let's talk a bit about what's currently being done in the aquaculture arena regarding spiny lobster. The major players currently are gonna be Australia, Vietnam, and Indonesia. Australia is focused heavily on research R&D development and taking a hatchery-based approach for the species that I have up on the screen. Um, to the top left, Panelurus ornatus, which is a spiny lobster species um, that can be found in the South Asian region. And they've basically started the world's first hatchery, commercial hatchery for spiny lobster production that pretty much opened last year. Vietnam and Indonesia, however, they took a relatively different approach where their production is pretty much focused on the collection of wild caught puroli or wild seed for production, where they put out artificial collectors that mimic natural seaweed where lobster puroli essentially settle. And then they basically collect these puroli or larval stage lobsters and grow them up in sea cages. And this pretty much started relatively early in the 1990s. And currently it expanded for their production volume of about 1500 tons of lobster a year. And pretty much this, their interest and in why they keep pushing their spiny lobster aquaculture sector is pretty much due to increase consumer demand. They have a relatively high market for that lobster in other parts of Asia and across the world. There's been a lot of increased fishing effort for spiny lobster stocks globally. And as a result, most edible marine lobster species, including spiny lobster, are pretty much fully exploited or pushed to their maximum sustainable yield, pretty much meaning that capture fisheries cannot sustain the demand for spiny lobster 
um, moving forward in the future. So from a behavior context, why Caribbean spinal ops? So why is it a relatively good candidate for aquaculture? So one, it's a high value species. Um, as Bahamians, for sure, we know that everyone wants crawfish throughout the year. Um, and it has relatively fast growth from an aquacultural perspective when, when you compare it to the clawed lobster species. So the Humerus humerus, which is European lobster and Humerus americanus, which is the American lobster that people see a lot in red lobster. They relatively grow a lot slower in comparison to the crawfish or spine lobster, our species. Is a large scale commercial fishery in the Palmas, as we all know. It's also heavily exploited. And there's a lot of difficulties when it comes to monitoring the stock across this geographical range. And I'll touch a bit on that in the next slide. So we're gonna talk a bit here about the life cycle of spinal ops. I hope everyone can see the diagram um, well. So there's three of five major stages. You have your adult stage, your eggs, your phyllosoma, which is your um, larvae stage. And then you have your post-larval stage and your juvenile lobster. So the, the parts and stages I'm gonna focus heavily on here, which are a major part of my research are gonna be that phylosoma larvae stage and that peerless post-larval stage. So essentially for six to eight months, once the eggs hatch after buried females release them into the water column and the eggs hatch, the larvae travel hundreds of miles from where they were essentially released. And they're pretty much at the mercy of the ocean currents and that the ticks, I mean, dictates where they get um, distributed in the pelagic zone. And during that phase and that stage, they're pretty much pelagic in nature, meaning they're gonna be out in the open ocean. After that six to eight months period, they go through a metamorphosis and they wanna become benthic. Essentially, they wanna to go to the sea bottom. And that's the stage that we relatively see them, see them at. So based on what a lot of work that's been coming out of Asia where their aquaculture of spiny lobster is pretty much based on wild capture and wild collection of seed, for their production, um, for the end goal production of spiny lobster. What I'm gonna be looking at is one, how can we pretty much utilize this technique in a more sustainable manner than they did to produce the results that we wanna get. So there's two key concepts that I'm gonna be looking at. So source populations essentially. So your source population is essentially areas that, that pretty much contribute to the juvenile and adult populations. So when these puerile or post-larval spiny lobsters or I would say baby spine lobsters for, for um, a better um, way to say it. They wanna settle. When they settle, they essentially are looking for habitat. So seagrass beds, um, mangrove areas, coral um, heads, where it gives them crevices to hide, um, essentially food that's gonna provide the nutritional, um, um, nutritional support that they need to get to the next larval, to the next life cycle stage. And these areas that have that complexity and that makeup of ecosystems that provide them nutrition and the shelter that they need. This is what they essentially seek out in these areas will be source populations because these sites foster a relatively high survival rate. So once you get the high survival rate, these individuals eventually contribute to the juvenile and about populations that eventually contribute to what fishers would catch when crawfish or spine lobster is in season. So the other concept is sink populations. And these essentially be areas that don't have that habitat complexity to provide shelter and nutrition that these organisms need once they settle. So in sink populations, what generally occurs, you get a relatively high level of mortality and survival rates tend to be less than 1%. So a big concept of looking at biological neutrality where you essentially Take it, you essentially tap into these sink populations, identify where they are, tap into them, and they pretty much go in and collect lobsters from um, post larval lobsters from these areas because they're not, in most cases, going to survive anyway. So, one, you could take these lobsters from these areas um, in the aquaculture scenario, grow them out to harvestable size, and then they're going to be in the market. Or from a stock enhancement and conservation aquaculture point of view, you can rear them to a more hardier stage and ultimately release them back into the wild when they have a relatively improved chance of survival. And ultimately, they will be able to contribute to the juvenile and adult populations in the future. So just a quick general overview of how my PhD looks. My chapters are looking at the identification of bottlenecks to Caribbean and spinal lobster in the Bahamas. Chapter two is essentially looking at that Caribbean spinal lobster post-larval resource in first in the Luthra. So 
do we have pure lie here? Can we tap into this resource? Are there source and sink populations that are available for us to gain access to that can we can eventually build a Caribbean spine lobster aquaculture industry on, whether that's for production or for stock enhancement. Chapter three, looking at ways to, not, to optimize nursery conditions and impacts that seawater chemistry has on how these lobsters molt and calcify, because that's how essentially that they grow and get bigger. Four, how can we optimize diets in the sustainable, in, in the production of the nursery phase? Um, and how can we provide adequate nutrition during this very vital st life stage of the lobster? And then five, looking at spiny lobster grow out um, scenarios and what systems work for us in the Bahamas. So RAS being recirculating aquaculture systems, then the sea cage systems relatively what should be a cage, some other area in the ocean that you would grow out um, lobster in. So I'm gonna focus on two main um, chapters here that I'm gonna discuss about and how and the role that they play in the development of Caribbean spine lobster aquaculture in the Bahamas due to the time limitations that we have. So one is recirculating aquaculture systems and relatively what our, our RAS system is, it's pretty much a closed loop system where you have all the interworkings of mechanical filtration, water treatment and aeration in terms of providing oxygen for the organism that you grow in. So from a spine lobster context, you're gonna ba basically have some natural water input source that goes through an array of filters um, that pretty much take out any particulates, any pathogens that could cause adverse effects to the lobster that you're gonna grow. And basically you feed them in the system. And once you feed them, you pretty much get a lot of biological um, happenings working in that system that I won't go into. But why these systems are really good is they limit the amount of water use that you use because up to 80, 90% of the water is gonna be recycled across the system. Um, I'm gonna to switch to the next slide and talk about it a bit more. It gives you a lot of environmental control of what you wanna do in the system, which ultimately improves your disease control in the system as well. But it does have some weaknesses. It relies heavily on a proper electricity supply. From a Bahamian context, this could be revenued by utilizing solar system technology to provide electricity that we need. You need a reliable water source. You need staff that are essentially trained with a technical skill set to operate such systems. Also, opportunities that can come from these RAS systems for spinal lobster production. Ultimately, we design and build some form of land-based aquaculture for Caribbean spinal lobster and other viable species. And also, it can form uh, alternative livelihood options for individuals who want to get into sustainable aquaculture. But we do have some threats that are presented here. One could be the lack of adoption of RAS technology, pushback from fishers who may see aquaculture of spinal lobster as a competition to their endeavors. And then also cage culture may be more profitable and less um, economically straining than RAS system use. So another really interesting um, thing I'm gonna talk about is insect-based feed ingredients for diets, not only for spiny lobster, but for aquaculture um, species in general. So just a quick overview, fish meal and shrimp meal and krill meal are really high main main components of formulated diets for aquaculture species because they are relatively high in protein and they have an amino acid profile that really helps a lot of aquaculture species grow rel relatively well and that's fin fish and also crustacea and the problem with that is a lot of these marine based ingredients tend to be re become relatively expensive because they're based on capture fisheries which are becoming a lot more scarce as cash fisheries um, are reducing, as I mentioned earlier. And also in addition to that, a lot of retailers and consumers are beginning to have, have a bit more, become a bit more aware of the environmental sustainability of the things that they eat and the foods that they purpose, purchase and the health benefits that these foods provide. So essentially there's a massive growing concern of the sustainability of aquaculture practices that use high percentage of marine inputs like fish meal and krill meal and so on. So a lot of the aquaculture industry is going, moving towards a lot of land-based and more sustainable sources of feed ingredients to put into diets for um, aquaculture um, species. And one big thing has been insect-based feed ingredients, so such as insect meal and insect oil. So I have two examples here. On the left, you have the yellow mealworm, which has been shown to pretty much being able to be instituted into diets of Pacific shrimp 
and essentially didn't affect feed intake, growth rate, um, FCR, which is food conversion ratio, and survival. So it pretty much was able to replace fish meal um, as a viable option in the, in the diets of Pacific shrimp. And then on the right, I have black soldier fly larvae, which pretty much was used in the diets of freshwater crayfish, which is a form of crustacean, and then improved gut health and immune parameters, which means it pretty much boosted the overall animal health and welfare of the organism, organism which shows that insect-based in feed ingredients are really good way to move the aquaculture industry forward in a sustainable manner. And pretty much as these organisms, as these insect-based, sorry, as these insect-based meals, these insects themselves can be produced pretty much on food waste. And food waste is pretty much something that every country has in abundance. We have a, lo a lot of it in abundance as well, because a lot of food waste does tend to go to the landfill in the Bahamas. So a lot of these food waste could be reworked and repackaged to produce these insects that ultimately could be used to make insect feed based ingredients for the aquaculture industry. So where do we need to go from here? If you wanna achieve some form of spinal lobster aquaculture in the Bahamas and ultimately the wider Caribbean, one, we need to assess the pre resources that we do have and like a population and activity, identify sink and source populations to see where, where lobsters are breeding, where pre are coming from before we do any, before we move forward with any extraction of pre to ensure that whatever things that we do is done in a sustainable manner that can be maintained in the long term. We're not adversely affecting our spine loss of population down the road. Three, we need to develop some form of collect, sustainable collection techniques. So when we do collect pre what materials do we use to build our collectors? Are they sustainable? Could they be produced extensively in the long term? Four, we need to look at ways at which, what production systems are we gonna to utilize to grow these species in? And five, develop some form of locally sourced feed ingredients to support our production. And also research policy and regulation plays a big role in the, in the development of any aquaculture industry and it wouldn't be different for the development of some form of spinal lobster aquaculture, whether that be for production of it as a, as a feed product or for conservation aquaculture or stock enhancement. One, we need to prioritize sustainable aquaculture R&D, research and development. We need that to be emphasized in the Bahamas because we do have the entities such as University of the Bahamas and BAMG that could take, um, take the mandate and start pushing for R&D in this area. We also need to build some for the credibility before we do anything. So we need to see how aquaculture would interact with the environmental, social, and economic factors um, across all levels of society and industry before, which will allow informed decision-making for regulation and also for the development of the sector. We also need to look at public engagement. So we need to build educational and social pro programs that engage with Bahamians across all social circles, in, including fishers, because they're really important to the development of any aquaculture industry, so that individuals see that it's a viable option moving forward. And also, we need to make sure that whatever we do makes a viable, a good and viable impact on um, the Bahamian society as a whole. And this could be done through community-based aquaculture initiatives and maybe even a Caribbean Spinal Lobster Stock Enhancement Program. So thank you everyone today for listening to my presentation. I hope that was helpful and everyone was able to gain some form of insight from it. All right, thank you so much for that, Michael. And um, next we'll have Vanessa Haley Benjamin. Yes, I'll go right ahead and um, share my screen. Um, can Michael can stop, stop sharing? sharing yeah. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm sorry. I'm trying to stop sharing right now. Sorry. <laughs> um, all right. There you go. All right. Thank you. Okay. Hold on. Just. Of course, this works in practice, but then when it's time, it doesn't work, right? 
Yeah, so while you get started, I just want to point out um, the comment from Lester Gittins about the need to protect the environment through aquaculture, as well as the concern about marine species as feed. I think that Michael answered those concerns with the transition to insect-based feed. And of course, everything that we do in the blue economy has to be sustainable. Oh. Was my video on? I don't. Oh, I don't know if my video was on. Hi, Michael. We can't see you, but I don't think you're sharing any, your screen anymore. Vanessa, are you having some difficulty sharing your screen? Yeah, I just need a. No, not sharing it. It's just. Um, bringing up the, the presentation. Of course, it works fine during practice, but Murphy's Law, right? But just a few seconds, I'm confident it'll come up shortly. Okay, now I will share. While we wait, um, there's a poll question out about persons who are interested in aquaculture. So about 94 persons have responded. So if you wanna click yes or no, it'll give us an indication as to whether or not we should put on a, a capacity building session on aquaculture or aquaponics training. Are you able to see my screen? No, it seems to be just, um, I don't know if you're on mobile, but we can't see a presentation. No? No. Hold on. Hold on. It's saying that I was sharing, but let me select it again. I do apologize. No problem. Okay, you can probably see now, right? Yes. Okay. Oh, this has to be good if it took that long to get started. <laughs> um, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you to the organizers for putting this together and thanks to the attendees for taking the time to attend and also the um, exciting discussions with the panelists. Um, about me, I'm a PhD student working in the field of molluscan cultivated seafood production. For my research, I am working specifically with oyster and clam. Um, I'm investigating the best cells to isolate. I think it will be the embryonic stem cells or larvae cells. And I'm determining what is the most suitable cell conditions to promote growth and what are the underlying mechanisms behind molluscan cell development and gene expression. And they're all important um, when we're talking about growing cells, a collection of cells form tissues, and those tissues eventually form the meat that we are used to um, eating and seeing. During this very short presentation, I will answer the question, what exactly is cultivated seafood production? For those who um, may never have heard of it, I will highlight the state of this new and emerging field and share my thoughts on its application as a potential fisheries management tool and the climate change adaptation strategy. Um, this is an interesting quote. The Right Honorable Sir Winston Churchill in 1931 said, we shall escape the absurdity of growing a whole chicken in order to eat the breast or wing by growing these parts separately under a suitable medium. Well, guess what? He was right and he was wrong. Um, the first lab grown meat product was an, a hamburger that was fried up in 2013. And he got the date wrong though. He predicted that, we that this would have happened 32 years sooner actually. So what is cultivated seafood or meat? Um, it is an edible seafood product grown directly from cells. And this is done in vitro um, in a controlled setting. And it replicates the taste 
and texture of conventional meat and seafood. And researchers are working on many aspects of the production process, which I'll share with you next. But cultivated seafood can also be referred to, you'll hear many names for cultivated seafood, um, cellular agriculture, cell-based or cell-cultured foods. Um, these are some familiar terms you would hear. The first cultivated meat product was actually produced, um, it was, a, it was more of a ground meat texture and it was used in burgers and sausages. And as more research is done, we will start to see more steaks and uh, fillets being produced. And just in case you were wondering what this cultivated seafood product can look like, here is a tweet from one of the companies working in the space. It's not yet commercially available, but you can see they, they grew the salmon themselves indoors in the middle of the city, no fishing or fish farming required. The future of seafood tastes incredible. So this just gives you an idea of the possibility. What is commercially available already? We do have cultivated chicken, a cultivated chicken product that went on sale in 2021 after receiving regulatory approval in Singapore, the first in the world actually. So this here um, is an exciting illustration. Um, it, provides a, it provides you with a general overview of the cultivated meat production process compared to traditional animal agriculture. Now, the illustration itself refers to cow cells but I want you to know that the process remains generally the same even for seafood. Um, so what happens is an initial sample of cells is taken from a healthy living organism. And my research is really focused on this portion of the production process in determining which cells will be um, best to promote growth and what conditions do those cells require to promote growth. Um, the cells are provided water and feed in a cultivator, and you see a little, uh, a little pro prototype of what a cultivator could look like just in simple form. Um, and the cells are allowed to grow, so they're allowed to grow on their own. After the meat is grown to the desired um, size and characteristics, and there are persons working in the space researchers as well on, you know, what, how do we get the texture and how do we get the consistency of the meat that consumers are used to and can uh, and identify with. So there's great work that's um, going on in this space. And then once this is done, the meat can then be harvested. Um, overall, the average production time is considerably um, shorter. Uh, you can see here for cellular agriculture, it's five to seven weeks compared to the production time of traditional agriculture that's 112 weeks. So since Professor Mark Post produced the first cultivated, and actually it was a $300,000 beef burger in 2013, at least a dozen companies had debuted chicken, yellowtail, duck, pork sausage, and salmon. No need to hurt your eyes trying to read the logos but you can get an appreciation that there are quite a few companies that have emerged either to create, support, or fund new products such as cell-based or plant-based. I'm not getting into the plant-based products in this presentation because I'm dealing more with the cell-based and seafood, but do know that um, in the plant-based space as well, there are researchers working on using plant materials to mimic the taste of seafood. So the possibilities are, are endless. You may even notice some um, brands that are recognizable like Tyson and Starbucks. So there are many companies getting into already in this space, I should say. By the end of 2019, 55 companies launched around the world. Um, in 2019 alone, $75 million in total was raised by cultivated meat companies. One third of these companies are based in the US with large concentrations existing in the EU and the UK region, Canada, Israel, and of course, in Asia Pacific. Um, as equally significant, more governments 
recognize that cultivated meat is the future of sustainable, scalable meat production. Um, the EU European Commission granted Dutch startup Meatable $3 million to help bring cultivated pork to market. Um, and Belgium's government created a consortium of companies working on um, cultivated faux gras with 3.6 million uh, euros. So there is certainly opportunity and the industry has its set of challenges and important benefits. Um, the main challenge in the industry will be reducing costs ensuring scalability and price parity. I don't know about you, but a $300,000 burger or $9,000 um, uh, uh, chicken per pound product is, is not feasible to take to market. So we have to reduce these costs. Um, isolating the cell line. So again, I will be working with the cells um, for clams and oysters with hopefully application to conch. And I want to isolate the cells um, from the species of interest. That's going to be an initial challenge. Um, research and development is important. Uh, working with seafood in particular is even more challenging compared to terrestrial species. Little work has been done on cell culture protocols and cell line development in fish, and even less in mollusks, which are um, shellfish, which I will be studying. Regulatory approval is the challenge. We see that we only have one, despite all those companies that are doing the work. But I know in the US, the FDA and USDA um, will have oversight of um, cultivated meat in general. Um, even though regulatory approval is challenging, it's certainly not insurmountable. And consumer acceptance, along with stakeholder involvement, are two components that I think are critically important for the future success of this field. Cultivated meat and seafood could increase access to meat and seafood. It can be cultivated anywhere and can support regional and local economies. So it's important for the industry to continuously evaluate the environmental impact of cultivated meat and seafood as the industry evolves, as well as continuing to demonstrate safety to, to help with consumer acceptance. There are many possibilities with cellular agriculture, opportunities to produce new proteins, to tailor the nutritional profile of meat, and to grow species we don't traditionally eat. Or even we can use cell agriculture to grow conch pearls. Um, once you have the cell that is responsible for the production of pearls, you can grow that also. So having worked on all aspects of the conservation field over the past 20 years, I became aware of the challenges our ocean currently face and that we can potentially face in the future. This article in one of the local dailies on January 11th, 2019 read, Conk may be wiped out in 10 to 15 years. And this really inspired my research. You know, Conk take five years to mature. There's a lot of energy expended and created the shell. And I came up with um, this, what I thought initially was a crazy idea and realized it wasn't crazy after all, what if we can bypass and, 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 and speed up the time and just grow the meat itself? And that's where the whole idea of cellular agriculture came in. Climate change predictions for the Caribbean um, are only going to exasperate problems even more as species abundances and distribution is expected to be negatively impacted and fish will start to move northward from the tropics to, um, to colder waters at the poles. Um, I would like to further explore this idea of using cultivated seafood production as a fisheries management tool and climate change adaptation strategy. I look forward to our continued discussion around this theme, food of the future. Um, I will hand it back over to our moderator and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Vanessa. Thank you to all of our panelists for that wealth of information. Um, so we're going to quickly move into our question segment. Um, and panelists, please know that you have a minute or less to answer each question. So I'm going to begin with our first question to Dr. Mara. So Dr. Mara, can you comment on the importance of inclusion in developing solutions for sustainable food production from our oceans? And how it relates to balancing the needs of fisher people and the need for conservation. 
Yes, thank you. It's a it's a great question, and and just want to quickly say that um, all the presentations were excellent. So thanks to my fellow panelists. It's it's really an honor to get to be on this panel with you all. Um, so I think inclusion is really important, um, and there's a couple of different reasons for this. So first, as I as I mentioned in the um, presentation no matter how many resources, you know, a government can be the best at, at monitoring and enforcement and still is going to miss some things. It's just impossible, especially um, when we look at small scale fisheries where there's many, many fishers, you know, tens of thousands in some cases scattered along the coasts to monitor everything. And so by including fishers, by including coastal communities as part of the management process, whether that's through stakeholder engagement practices, whether it's through, again, um, more formalization of organizations that can then be co-management bodies, that, that all helps to alleviate some of that burden on the government so that they can then focus on the real problem areas and start to shut those down. So I think inclusion is really important um, for incentivizing participation in best practice and, and co-management. Also, fishers again are living their challenges every day and have extraordinary knowledge that none of us can have because they're the ones that are out there day after day after day in the system. And so by having inclusive and participatory processes where fishers are part of the solution, they can really be coming up with um, some very innovative ways of, of moving sustainable fisheries forward. And often they are very motivated to do so because their livelihood depends on that long-term sustainability. So for all of these reasons, I think that it's, it's really critical um, that we, we do include uh, fishers, but also coastal communities in the process. Uh, we know that 3 billion people on the planet rely on seafood as, a prime, as their primary source of protein. Um, one in 10 uh, individuals face malnutrition due to loss of access to seafood and protein. And so as we're designing these interventions, as we're looking at blue economy development, especially as it pertains to fisheries and food production, such as aquaculture, figuring out how we make sure that the local resources not only serve as a livelihood for individuals, but also can meet the nutrition needs of individuals, and the food security needs of those communities is really, really important. And so they have to be part of that process. Thank you, Deb. Thank you for that um, response. Um, and next up, we're going to have a question from our panelists, sorry, from our, from our audience. So it is directed towards Michael. So Michael, aquaculture has been a challenge to get off the ground in the Bahamas. Do you think we have the right partnership, regulatory framework, and the right education system in place? Are we really ready to implement aquaculture in the Bahamas? Um, that's a really good question. Um, the Bahamas and other Caribbean agents have faced the same challenge in trying to get aquaculture off the ground and make it like a major part of their economies. I think one issue is is it's, I think one issue is definitely socially. Um, I think Caribbean people in, in general really loves to just eat fish that's, get, that's wild caught and from the ocean. I think that's a big barrier to aquaculture as well. Um, from a partnership point of view, I think, I think there's a lot of good stuff happening in the work John's doing. He's part, he does a lot of work with University of Miami. Um, there's BAMZ with their aquaponics system. They're doing a lot of good work. And I think it's a lot of potential from the University of the Bahamas as well. Um, to get on board and start um, either doing R&D and aquaculture and looking at what species can work um, across the Bahamas. Um, so I just think, yeah, investment in the industry is a big thing. And aquaculture is just like every other business. It needs to make a profit. You just can't sing, sing it as a good song and saying, oh, it's going to work and all the positives and about it because there are negatives. It, it's just like any other business. And just like startups, you're going to have to have enough money to get everything off the ground, um, whether that's buying pumps, whether that's buying tanks, whether that's buying feed, which is going to be a big cost um, in any aquaculture business. So I think I think business point of view, um, which usually is one aspect, anyone who gets into farming of, of any of any um type, I think training in that area needs to be a big thing as well. And then from the educational system, I think it needs to be in schools. I think um, every school should have at least some sort of aquaculture um, um, program in the school um, so the kids know that it's a viable option for them once they're graduated. Because me, me per se, I, I had no idea about this field until I got into, into university. 
So I think I think just from putting it into schools and getting kids more familiar with the idea of aquaculture and how it can help them as an individual, as a viable industry, but also help the nation um, have more sustainable seafood production. I think that's one place we definitely need to start. All right, thank you for that. Um, so we have a question for Mr. Chayton. Um, what, can you identify the biggest challenge in terms of um, that needs to be overcome in order to increase aquaculture production in the Bahamas? So Michael touched on a lot of the challenges um, in terms of education, regulation, but what do you deem as one of the, or the largest or biggest challenge currently? Oh, Mr. Chayton, you are muted. Is that better? Can you hear yes. me? Right. Yes, we can. Uh, Michael did sum it up pretty well. He did mention a few uh, resources there with uh, in education and BAMV, and uh, I want to get down a little bit more specifics. Yeah, you might want to reach out to uh, Dr. Valier Delavo at BAMV. He teaches courses in aquaponics and, aqu and aquaculture there. He has a wealth of knowledge and very receptive to uh, talking to people that want to learn the, about this. Uh, you can also reach out to Shakira Lightburn, Lightborn at IECA. Uh, I'm going to throw out her phone number there, 393-8881 or 8882. Um, if you're interested in aquaponics and even seeing what's happening here in NASA with aquaponics and learning from that. You might want to reach out possibly. Uh, I hope I can mention Janet Johnson's name. She's the CEO, Executive Director at the Tourism Development Corporation here in NASA. And uh, she might be able to give you some leads on uh, aquaponic systems that are happening here in NASA that you might be able to possibly visit. Um, there, uh, there are probably the biggest single obstacle to potentially being success, successful beside training and financing and technology and all this, when you're getting down to doing aquaculture here in NASA and in, or in the Bahamas, uh, I think one of the biggest obstacles is the cost of power. The cost of power here is four to five times what you would pay in other parts of the world. And in order to compete on a global basis, that has to be resolved, okay? Whether you're getting your power uh, from additional systems like solar or wind or ocean, something has to be done here. So the cost of power is not so excessive as to prevent success in aquaculture. Yeah. Okay. All right, well, thank you so much. So it definitely looks like solar is the answer um, for the way forward. Um, we have a question for Vanessa from Ms. Ann Albury. In cellular agriculture, with will the cell be genetically modified? How do we address the ethical concerns similar to GMO crops? There can be a lack of trust between consumers and companies now. Great question. And I had a feeling this would, would come up. So yes. with um, cellular agriculture, it doesn't necessarily mean genetically modified. Um, companies, um, scientists, we can choose whether or not we're going to produce cultivated meat and seafood with or without the use of genetic engineering. Um, I, I, I wanna clearly um, state and emphasize that, that what we're doing um, is taking the cells from, from the animal and just growing it in a controlled environment. So you don't have to worry about toxins. You don't have to worry about microplastics. And um, just to reiterate, it doesn't necessarily have to involve genetic engineering. And that's going to be a scientist a choice. It's going to be a company choice. All right, thank you for that response. Um, moving on, we have a question from Ruel Bo. Would shellfish farming be more sustainable than fin fish farming? Um, and I send, send the question to the panelists if anyone wants to answer it. Yeah, I, I, could, I could touch on it um, a little bit. 
Um, yeah, shellfish farming definitely could be a, could be viewed as a bit more sustainable than um, finfish farming, simply for the reasons that most shellfish farming is in it's a uh, is a non-fed species. So species um, organisms like mussels, clams, oysters, they generally are utilized one to as a keystone species in environments and ecosystems, and pretty much they can be grown in our environments that have natural sources of, of um, nutrients in the water itself. And that's how they generally would grow. So they can be more sustainable than finfish um, species. The only issues here, waters in the Bahamas tend to be not so nutrient rich. So that could be a barrier to shellfish farming in the Bahamas, but there's ways to get around that by integrating multi-trophic aquaculture where you incorporate um, shellfish, which is a non-fed species with other species that tend to be fed, such as thin fish or crustaceans. And their waste, their waste products, pretty much what they produce can be utilized to feed um, shellfish. Um, there's, there's a species mangrove cup oyster, which, which has aquaculture potential in the Bahamas. So maybe if someone wants to look into the possibility of that, that might be pretty, pretty good. Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, so we have a question again for Mr. Chayton, um, and it comes from Godfrey Roll. I understand that part of the migratory route for tuna passes through Bahamian waters. Do you see the possibility of Bahamian fishers becoming involved in fishing for this species? And are there particular areas in our waters that might be the best spots to fish? Mr. Chayton? Uh, the, answer, the answer to that question is yes. Um, tuna has some real potential here. Uh, I think that tuna is, uh, fishing for tuna is kind of lumped in uh, or, or thought of by some of the recreational fishers as um, detrimental uh, to be uh, harvested on a commercial basis that it would somehow impact uh, recreational fishing and, uh, and um, you know, the tourist industry for recreational fishing where they come out and big game fish, that sort of thing. When in fact, um, Unfortunately, some of these species are being harvested uh, way out at sea by foreign countries currently, and uh, that can be tracked by looking at vessels um, uh, tracking routes and in, in outside of Bahamian waters. But the, the tuna do pass right through here, and they could be harvested. There's several methods of doing it, long lining, which can be very specifically targeted for that, and of course, uh, uh, individual, individual deep drop or drop line. All right, thank you so much for that, Mr. Chayden. And we have a question from Mr. Latin, Lester Giddens again for the entire panel. Um, and so we'll get two panelists to respond to this. Remember keeping your responses under a minute. So the question asks, do, will do panelists see backyard aquaculture for subsistence as a possibility in the Bahamas? So, does anyone want to go first? Well, back, backyard aquaculture uh, certainly <laughs> is, a, is a possibility. In fact, when you do backyard aquaponics, part of that is growing fish. And so, you know, you're growing, uh, you're not just growing plants, you're getting, you're harvesting fish if you use tilapia. There's several uh, species of freshwater uh, animals that you could be using. It doesn't have to be tilapia. It could be freshwater shrimp. It could be all kinds of things, but there's uh, uh, that are freshwater, uh, even trout if you had cold enough water. But there's uh, other other species I'd listed in my my um, talk that are freshwater that could be utilized with aquaponics. So there is that aquaculture component to growing aquaponics. It is a very practical way to produce your own fish at home in your backyard inexpensively and nutritiously. Okay. Thank you for that response. Um, and so this question is for Vanessa. Um, this will be our final question um, if, there, if nothing else comes in. So this question asks, what do you estimate to be the impact on recreational fishing and tourism by 2030? Very good question, Ms. Crystal Bethel. Mm, by 2030. Um, I can't certainly say definitively what will happen in 2030, but um, climate change um, is exasperating, uh, will exasperate our fisheries. 
and looking at fisheries in general, and this is capture fisheries as well as recreational fisheries in that context is extremely important. Um, we can expect to see um, changes to ocean currents, sea surface temperatures, um, experience ocean acidification, and these are some these are some recent studies that um, scientists have come up with specifically for the Caribbean. Um, we can possibly experience damage to critical uh, fishing habitats, and that includes the recreational fish, fish, fish fishery as well. We can see reduced growth and productivity of fish stocks, so smaller, fewer fish. And I think most dramatically, we can see um, changes in the species cost as fish start to move more northwards from to colder waters from the tropics. And because of that, the FAO is calling for the implementation of adequate climate change adaptation measures. I think we need to prepare for that and preparing for that is monitoring our stocks. It's being able to detect these changes and then adapting our management strategies and tools and using tools like aquaculture and um, cultivated seafood production as um, adaptation strategies. So we certainly have to prepare because we can't expect changes as early as 2030 or even now. I mean, off the coast of North Carolina, I'm sorry, the coast of California, they're already seeing um, small baby great whites heading more north than they usually would. And off the coast of Japan, we're already seeing kelp forests now being um, dominated by corals. So we're going to have these changes in our ecosystem and these shifts, and we have to prepare for them. Thank you for that response, Vanessa. Um, we have another question here for Mr. Chayden. Um, it comes from Jensen Williams. So it's, two, it's a two in one question. The first part of it asks, isn't long line fishing against the law in the Bahamas? And the second part is, how can we utilize the drones to police this form of fishing? Yes, uh, long line fishing is currently against the law in the Bahamas. So uh, I'm not advocating that people go out there and start long line fishing, of course. What I was mentioning is the fact that tuna is being harvested offshore, just uh, commercially, just not by Bahamians. And so that needs to be remedied. Uh, but I uh, just mentioned long line as a potential method of catching those fish. As far as the use of drones, I'm not really familiar with using drones. Uh, I really can't speak to that. Okay, great. Um, so that is going to conclude our session. So I just want to um, once again thank our panelists for participating in this session of our webinar. Um, we're grateful for your time and the expertise that you've shared with us. Um, to our audience, thank you again for tuning in, and we look forward to seeing you in the remaining three sessions throughout the rest of the day. So thank you once again, and any final comments from our panelists before we wrap up? No, just thank you so much. Really appreciate this opportunity and, and look forward to continuing to watch all of your work uh, progress. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, thank you. Thank you as well. Sean, and then Vanessa. Thank, thank you, you uh, Regina. Thank you, thank you, other panelists and uh, people that called in and wrote in. Thank you all. All right. All right. Thank you, guys. So I'll all turn right, the mic you. back over to Ms. Sumeya Cargo. Thank you, everyone. Um, that was a great session. It went a little bit long. I think that what we've discovered is that there's a lot of appetite to have these kind of conversations. So we're going to have to do this again on a bigger scale next time. Um, we have run a bit long. So I'm going to give everybody a four minute break. And then we're going to come back for our next session, bioextractives. Thanks so much, guys. While we wait for the next session, I see that there are some hands raised in the chat. Um, would anybody like to make some comments or questions or say anything to the panelists that are still on? You're welcome to do so. Prescott, I see your hand raised. Are you, would you like to make a comment or ask a question? Uh, 
Adrian. Yes. Hi, Adrian. Hi. Yes. Yeah, so I had a concern for Vanessa. I don't know if she's still there, um, okay. but it was in regards to the conch pearl cultivation. Mm -hmm. And I had a concern on um, whether cultivating conch pearls in this way would only be valuable after the conch would have been lost to us. And if in some way we can use some of those efforts to preserving the conch instead, you know, or, you know, it, that too, but preserving the conch so that we don't lose that as a part of our, our culture. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, I think that's the first step and, and we take sound um, conservation measures and, and regulatory measures to, to manage the fishery. I think that the current condition is going, there are some factors that we certainly can't control. And unfortunately, climate change is, is one of them. And, um, and I think we, we have to prepare for that. But, but of course, the, our first step is to have healthy stocks and um, doing what we have to do to ensure that because healthy fisheries are resilient fisheries and they can potentially you know, withstand some of the shocks we're going to see with, with climate change. But um, even in that regard, we have to plan ac accordingly. Okay, great, thank you. I'm glad there's some effort going towards that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, my background, 20 years in conservation, working in nonprofit and, and helping lead um, the con conservation campaign with Bahamas National Trust. So it's, that's definitely the, the first step in our, in our strategy. Great, amazing, thank you. You're welcome.